Paula, I sort of wanted to just start by thinking a little bit about JCI and about what you're doing and some of the issues that you're facing. And I, I, I suppose it would be good just to ask why healthcare organizations uh, around the world are seeking your accreditation. What, does it, what difference does it make? It's a, it's a great question, and it's a question that uh, we've uh, only grappled with. It's only a, a phenomenon that's really been going on for about 15 years. Uh, the Joint Commission in the United States has been accrediting hospitals since 1951, and so we're one of the largest and certainly I think one of the oldest doing that kind of work using standards to improve the quality of care that is uh, rendered in various healthcare settings. But about 15 years ago, we did, our organization did not actively seek to become a global company, but in fact, hospitals outside the United States came to Chicago and said, we'd like you to accredit us. We want to be accredited similar to the American hospitals. So it was a proactive decision on the, uh, the, on the part of the hospitals themselves. It was, and it is primarily a hospital business, although that's changing rapidly. Uh, and so the initiative came from outside the US. And at that point, the uh, company said, well, you know, this is something we're not certain about. Quite frankly, some of the American hospitals, I think, were a little threatened by it. And so they gave it to what uh, a subsidiary part of the Joint Commission, which is where I'm the CEO. And uh, so step by step over about 15 years, we went from zero to about 700 organizations now that are either accredited by us or some portion of what they do is certified by us. And it's become a very interesting business. It grows around 10% a year, very organically. We do do marketing and sales and things like that. But hospitals have found value in what it is we do. So what do we do? We're a risk management company. So in the process of delivering uh, important health care, um, we help organizations do it safely so that we reduce the pr uh, potential for harm in, in terms of doing anything. Medication is a big area. Infection control is a big area. And using our standards and the way that we do the survey process, uh, we help organizations render that care much more safely. Now, hospitals did make these choices because they wanted to learn more about how to do that, but there are other drivers that have definitely been part of the growth of this business, and one of them is the phenomenon of medical travel. Mm. So when you have hospitals around the world that are competing for patients uh, and they want to attract some of these uh, travelers, then having an international seal, which is what we, at the end of our process, you get a gold seal that says, you know, you've had an external party review your processes and look at how you render care and you're doing it safely, that that helps them in attracting patients who are traveling for health care now. And it, it's, it, you know, I, I kind of, I'm not comfortable with the medical tourism, but much more of the medical traveler, because there are a lot of people that travel now for health care because of some of the reasons that were mentioned earlier on the panel, that um, what they need and want is not available where they live. Uh, emerging middle classes have given people resources to buy health care in ways that they haven't be, uh, before. Uh, waiting lists, things like that, and you know, go, going to better systems. So we see a lot of uh, interregional uh, movement of patients uh, from places like Europe to the Middle East, from the United States, within Asia, Asia to Asia. Uh, all of those things also have uh, made hospitals and other providers interested in having an international accreditation symbol of, of the quality that they uh, do in terms of uh, delivering care. Can I just ask you briefly to reflect on the previous conversation? Because one, I know you and I spoke a little bit about this sense that chronic diseases, the rise and rise of chronic diseases is going to transform in some ways the way in which hospitals operate and the, the need for greater levels of public care. Could you just... That, that is definitely a global phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, a lot of countries now where we still, you know, out in the United States we still build hospitals, but certainly not at the pace yeah. that we did historically, both due to demographic changes, but to a great extent because of how care is being delivered now. We're moving much more to an outpatient kind of uh, setting for a lot of procedures that used to be done in, in uh, inpatient, and that's happening globally as well. Um, but I think everybody's grappling with, uh, many, many, many countries, with some exceptions, are grappling with aging populations and a higher, higher incidence of chronic disease. And I think the challenge that the states, the United, U.S. is facing is very similar to European countries, to places like Japan, um, even in countries uh, in the Middle East, for example, where um, a lot of new development is going into the building of hospitals, but the diabetes rates in, in certain countries in the Middle East far, far exceed 
what's happening in the United States, and whether or not there's a community-based, you know, integrated system of care to take care of those patients, it's pretty questionable right now. They're, you know, I think the instinct is to build beds, and in some countries there's still a substantial need for additional beds. The ERs are backed up, there's long wait times. So we know that there's probably not a perfect balance there in terms of beds versus needs. But when you put the factor in, in terms of what really is going on with those patients and how much of the care they need is really outside the hospital, um, and then you also integrate that with the idea that, which I think over time, a lot of these beds are not going to be necessary. I'm, I'm concerned that some places are making the wrong investment decisions, and are they overbuilding in the, the big uh, edifices as opposed to really putting some of these systems of care into the community? So, healthcare navigators, you know, extension, extenders of the healthcare professionals, which is a big issue around the globe, do we have enough people to take care of all these folks with a chronic disease? And as, uh, what are, how are you bringing, how is, you know, how, is, how is GE Ultrasound bringing better care to people around the world, and what are some of the challenges that you're facing? Yeah. Well, let me start a little bit with the globalization part. I came to, uh, to GE about 15 years ago. At that time, GE was a big company, very North American view on what was happening. The definition of globalization at that time was uh, how much can you sell internationally? And I was, uh, I was starting, more. I had a background from non-US, came from a small country, no real home market. I, I had the, uh, the um, I've been living in, in multiple countries. So I had a pretty much an international background. So we started to work on that whole mindset first because we could see that the market in the developed world is probably going to have a, a growth challenge at some point in time. So the, the opportunity would be all the developing markets. We at that stage had 90% revenue in, in, in the um, developed markets. We had one site uh, in the US, two, three products. Today, and, and, the, and the, you know, the size of the business at that time was maybe $300 million. Today it's about two and a half billion. We have 14 different sites globally, um, and uh, we have about 40 different products, basically using the same technology. So, so the name of the game was really to think globally in a different way, and to be global, you have to be local. If you're local, you understand the needs of the local challenges and opportunities. And, and that was the way we started to think about, first of all, be global, and, and, and tap into the opportunities. And, and the second one, this is a way to bring uh, care to a whole new set of new users and patients, so to speak. And I, even today, I would say we could be proud of that track record, but the uh, reality is that there is another, if I compare with the standard in developed markets uh, and who have easy access to ultrasound today, it's, it's, uh, it's another three billion people that should have an access to an ultrasound in every day. That's an untapped, it's an unserved community, which is a fantastic opportunity for a company, right? But it's a very unfortunate situation for those that don't get that service. So I, I would say our goal is to also set the target for the organization to go after the three billion, and that helps. So number one is to be local. I would say to really be present out there. I have a virtual staff today, no headquarters, they're all traveling, and that mindset helps big time. And, and define goals for, the, for, the, uh, for, for an organization to absolutely be out there. And, and the great thing is with ultrasound, and I, one of the reasons I'm here, is actually this has been adopted for GE to be the new mantra in how you globalize your company. So, so we have now started to put a lot of people out in the, in the field to be truly local and work from that angle. And that, that helps not only the healthcare part, but the rest of the organization. And it's one of, one of, the, one of the issues that sits there, of course, with equipment, tele, you know, med tech companies is that, um, you know, these are very expensive systems to put into place um, uh, in places where the resources are, are quite limited. Uh, how, how do you go about um, uh, that process of bridging the gap between healthcare resources and affordability and yeah. uh, appropriateness of technology? Yeah, that's a great question. It goes right back to the previous panel as well. You know, we, we all uh, suffering from uh, from the healthcare cost syndrome, and and the previous focus have been all about quality. How good could an image be, right? That that's kind of was the, the, the ultimate uh, focus of what we have done. We have changed that to to say there is a cost element and there is an access element. 
So three different things. And if that's your way of developing new uh, products, and you add the local component, so you have to address the needs of education, simplicity, different needs on different uh, countries, etc. That drives a whole different versatility to, to your uh, product development. Uh, and you can basically use the same technology, take out cost and adapt it to, to local needs. And we do that. So, so today, or if you go a few years back, an ultrasound system, I don't know how many had an ultrasound system, but most of you have been in front of a, uh, you know, a big system, size of a fridge kind of thing. And, and we have miniaturized uh, tremendously this. In, in fact, we have uh, pocket ultrasound systems today, which um, are just, just for the sake of the <laughs> proof point here, <laughs> Brought we'll one. Them in our pockets. Yeah, <laughs> so it actually fits into my pocket. And, and it is, uh, that's kind of a size of an ultrasound today, which is the same performance as it was 10 years ago of a big fridge system that used to cost $300,000. This one you can get down to maybe $7,000. Soon you'll put it on your iPhone, I'm sure. Just well, that brings me to the next point, because <laughs> you have to be connected. <laughs> and you're, you're right, that's in the pipeline of development, because it is not enough to just do the, um, the diagnosis on the spot. You have to be connected. In the imaging world, you need experts to read. So how do you get experts in, in sub-Sahara? They're not available, but they all have a mobile phone. So given that, that's the, that's the next step. That's the way forward. Yes. Cancer. I just wanted to start off talking about this because this is clearly one of the growing concerns uh, around the world. And so many countries, the World Health Organization uh, recently uh, talked about an epidemic uh, of cancer, um, uh, a truly major e epidemic that most countries were not really um, ready for. Um, and I, I just want to sort of start off by asking you um, what what is the what is what kind of what can we expect coming from cancer treatment in the in the near future and uh, how can we ensure that those new drugs those technologies are going to be available um, uh, in a way that uh, people who perhaps don't obviously can uh, can't obviously afford them have access to them um, to you know to innovative therapies well, how, how are we going to ensure that how are you going to ensure that should i say let me start, first of all, Charles, by thanking you for the invitation. And uh, I feel uh, very privileged to be part of such an esteemed uh, set of uh, panelists here. Um, cancer is uh, something that concerns all of us. And uh, unfortunately, it's touching all of us. Not necessarily as patients. It's touching us as fathers or sons or daughters or friends. And uh, I, I'm pleased to say that I have a positive message to offer to your question, what can we expect in cancer? I have good news. I do believe that uh, uh, cancer is the area that science will deliver the most meaningful uh, therapeutic solutions in the years to come. Uh, that uh, is due to an enormous activity that is happening as we speak across the globe uh, in several scientific institutions, in uh, in uh, the industry as a whole uh, that uh, is trying to deliver solutions for cancer. To give you a magnitude of the size, right now in uh, the whole world we have approximately 6,000 preclinical or phase one studies, which is basically the discovery phase of, of, uh, of a pharmaceutical product. 30% of them are devoted into cancer, more than uh, 2,000 studies right now in cancer. Of course, uh, many will not make it to the next phase, which is uh, the phase three, where it is really where we are going to develop the products. In fact, you need to know that for every product that uh, makes it to the market, most probably represents one of five to 10,000 failing attempts to bring a product to the market. Uh, depends on the type of the cancer which is, uh, of course, uh, an indication of uh, how complex and difficult are the issues that we are dealing. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the progress is uh, significant. Right now in the US, FDA has uh, a process that is called breakthrough therapy designation, which is uh, uh, giving to therapies that uh, they look extremely promising to deliver results. 36% of uh, all 
therapy, breakthrough therapy designations right now have been given to oncology, to, to cancer medicines. Um, now, why and how we expect uh, to see uh, uh, new solutions? The, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of the research, of course, means that we are touching many different aspects, but I think there are three uh, clear uh, trends that are game changers right now. One, it is the precision medicine that we are expecting to see in cancer. What does this mean? It is that uh, we are developing products that uh, they are relevant to a relatively small part of the population, but the, the impact or the results will be profound. Uh, which means that with biomarkers, we'll identify these people in the population that uh, this patient in the population that uh, we can have significant meaningful therapeutic effect by administering significant drugs. I'll give you an example. There is a, a medicine that we have uh, in the market. It is for lung cancer. Uh, it's Alcori, it's called. Um, this uh, works only for people that they have a specific gene mutation in their tumor. It is called ALK mutation. It is uh, 3 to 5 percent of the lung cancer patients. But the therapeutic effect in this 3 to 5 percent is extremely profound. Okay? That resulted in many things, many dynamics. The the pr this product, because exactly of this, of this magnitude of the clinical benefit that they offered, was able to demonstrate with much smaller clinical trials to the regulators, the effect, which means that it was able to be developed in much shorter timeline. The magnitude of the clinical benefit also gave confidence to regulators to approve it very fast with expedited processes. And of course, the cost to develop it was much smaller if you had to go to multi-year studies, which allows us to take multiple risks as we develop medicines and go to different places. Albert, I, I'm going to bring the next person up on stage, I, but I want to come back to some of that, and I want to come back to the appropriateness of costs, technologies, dissemination of these usually quite expensive drugs um, uh, in, a, in a moment. Palliative care, it's really uh, interesting where uh, I come from in Asia, that um, it's not, um, not an area of care that has, uh, has taken off, and I could stand to be corrected, but certainly not no, taken you're off correct. Anyway. Why, why is it important and what, you know, from a globalization perspective, how uh, is this going to make a difference, this particular approach to, to CAP? Well, I think one of the things, and thank you for having me here, um, but it's wonderful to see such a large group, uh, diverse group of individuals really focusing on improvement of health care. But one of the th greatest challenges that I think we face, both from a society and from healthcare systems, is the growth of the population of older adults. When you look by 2030, in this country alone, 20% of persons will be over the age of 80. And for most of us, that's going to be a time of good health, time spent with our family, time reflecting on what we accomplished in our life and what we want to do moving forward. But most of us are going to develop one or more serious illnesses, which we're going to live for a long period of time. And when you look at the concentration of spending, both in the United States and in the developed world, 5% of individuals over the age of 65 account for almost two-thirds of healthcare spending. And that's the group with one or more serious illness, one or more chronic illness, functional impairment, cognitive impairment. And the myth out there is that all of these costs get concentrated at the end of life. That when you look at all these costs for that 5%, they're all concentrated in the last six months to a year. The reality is that's a myth. 40% of costs are actually over multiple years, and it's only 10% which are in the last year of life. So what's palliative care? Palliative care is a relatively new model of healthcare delivery that focuses on improving quality of life for persons with serious illness and their families. And it does so by providing an added layer of support to the regular teams. And when we, look, when we look at the data for modern palliative care, what we find is that it accomplishes three things which we want in healthcare. First, it improves quality for patients. Their symptoms are better. 
they feel better their, and their families feel better. Second is it lowers healthcare costs because when you actually sit with patients with serious illness, ask them what their goals of care are and match those treatments to those goals, you have a much more efficient healthcare delivery system and costs go down. And when you think about it, it's the 5% which are driving most of the costs, but our systems are set up for the 95%. So it really is about outlier care. And the third thing is that when you provide palliative care at the same time as disease-directed care, survival increases so that people live longer. Um, we now have a number of studies that show palliative care when provided with disease-directed care. Not only every single study shows that there is actually same survival a trend towards better survival with palliative care or increased survival. To what extent then is this model um, easily transferable? Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is a, a question that almost everyone here um, uh, needs to answer or needs to, needs to sort of reflect on. I think the core components are easily transferable and I think what we need, you know, as a researcher, what I need your help with is figuring out what are the, how are the, what are the models and how do they work in different systems. So what are the key models of palliative care that are transferable? The first is comprehensive assessment, which doesn't have to be done by a physician, it can be done by a community health care worker around pain and other symptoms, family need. It requires appropriate communication about goals of care. And it used to be thought that you were born a good communicator. For example, when you're a doctor, you're born a good communicator or you become a pathologist, for example. <laughs> the reality is, the reality is these are skills that can be taught, they can be learned. And I can turn anybody in this room into a skilled communicator who can identify patients' values and goals, but I need to train you. That needs to happen and it needs to happen across healthcare systems and across professions. That's generalizable. And the third piece that I think clearly needs to be generalizable is pyramid systems of care that cross different settings so that you have physicians and nurse practitioners at the top of the pyramid who may be making the complicated medical decisions. You have social workers, other healthcare professionals who can help coordinate, and then you have healthcare workers at the bottom who are really doing sort of the hands-on care, getting people to appointments, making sure that medications are being treated. And as I said, that has to span across a continuum rather than being focused just in a hospital, just in a community agency. In this country, with the Affordable Care Act, there are now incentives for that to happen. And indeed, when you look at the growth of palliative care in this country, it started with academic medical centers. But the major innovation right now are in large systems and with the payers who are actually, as many of you know, moving from payers to also being providers, but the leaders have been groups like Aetna, Sutter Health, um, Intermountain, who are thinking about how do you deliver across a population. That model is appropriate in this country and translatable across many others. And that's, a, I think, a point that we, I'd like to pick up. Um, episodic care versus, you know, continuous, more yeah. continuous care, integrated care. Well, let me just let me just pick up with you, Anders. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, uh, on on the same topic, uh, I'm kind of skeptical to whether the healthcare systems will dramatically change quickly. So, and we, we've seen that over multiple years, and especially in the U.S. And, and Europe, it's been very very slow, even despite the, the cost pressure that's there, and, and even the say the, the the pressure from the population. So, I think technology should play a major role here. And more disruptive it can be, the better. So you, you know, talked about the miniaturization. We're talking about how has internet changed our lives, uh, mobile phones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The more we can do of that, I think is going to force changes by itself. And we see that on the topic of globalization. We've seen that in some, several countries already that they have leapfrogged the the established systems and have a different approach, pushed from consumers, patients themselves and also very innovative uh, use at, at the physician's level or normal healthcare workers are actually taking this, uh, these initiatives. So I think that's kind of another major driver we, we should really try to um, invest in and follow through. I mean, it uh, seems to me technology is a hugely important driver um, as are new innovations in drugs and so on and so forth. But I, I think you know, what, what you're saying here to me is that 
there's much more than just technology around these systems and you have to put in place uh, integrated care systems that are going to be effective around the technologies that are there in order to be able to, to create better health outcomes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wonder, Paula, whether you could comment around that because... I, and I, I think it's a combination. I think that, that this pyramid, I like the way you described the pyramid with the, how the workforce kind of arrays because I do think that we're all for facing shortages of physicians and nurses at the same time we have this explosion of chronic disease. So we've got to rethink practice, scope of practice, and who's doing what. And having those community workers, whether it's in the US or it's in the Middle East or it's in Asia, that's gonna be a key part of that. But the other part of it that didn't come up is the telemedicine, which is, I think, what you're talking about too. So when you have a combination of changing the practice, changing the scope, really having a, a community care network that is watching out for the health of a group of people, then I think the telemedicine and other kinds of technology like that really play a yeah. huge role in that you know, some of the important information about the patient is being transmitted not only through the network of community-based navigators or whatever you want to call that army of people that are going to help with that, but also back to the physician in a way that's much more expedient, much more accurate, and much more timely in, in, in terms of finding out what's happening in the home with that patient in the community. I think that's an absolutely key point because no matter what we do, we will not, never have the workforce that will address the population in need in the next 20 years. Um, we could triple the number of people coming out of medical school and nursing school. We will not have that population. So if we're going to actually care for chronic illness, we have to use technology and we have to have a way to make that integration seamless and more importantly that communication seamless so that somebody who's being cared for in you know, rural Alaska has, expertise, has access to the expertise, for example, in New York City, and you can spread that throughout the world. And I, and I think the one thing to keep in mind is this is becoming a global competition for that talent. Mm -hmm. You know, with the building that's going on in places like China and in the Middle East, the, the, one of the key challenges to a lot of the new hospitals that are being built is can you actually staff them? And in some of these countries, the, it's a lot of private equity moving into this space and they're willing to pay for the talent. And so, you know, we think in the US we're competing coast to coast. It's not like that at all anymore. We're really competing continent to continent in terms of talent and where our talent is going to go because we're still the number one educator of physicians, uh, and certainly for physicians. I don't know the numbers on nurses as well. But, uh, but they have, they, you know, young physicians have opportunities way beyond the borders of the United States. I throw this to the floor and uh Seek any uh, thoughts or, uh, or comments from the floor for our panelists. Down here, please, yeah. Could you just say your, your name and your organization, please? Sure, I'm Jeff. Just behind you. Jeff Masiak, and I'm an MBA student in health sector management. And this past summer, I worked at Philips Ultrasound. So my question naturally is for Mr. Wall. Um, you talked about going after the three billion people who need ultrasound. You look at products like VSTAN that are low margin and that market's very fragmented, adoption barriers are high. How do you um, scale that fragmented market with a low margin product in a way that increases access to healthcare? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question and uh, right in, the, in, uh, in our long-term strategy here that um, <clears throat> obviously three billion people is uh, very intriguing for, uh, for a business to, to go after. Uh, on top of that, we have the healthcare challenge uh, we look at this one as a very, very long-term kind of experiment to see how we could lower the barriers and get the adoption rate up. What I showed you is, is, is at the first stage. I think we need a lot of different uh, uh, elements to make that successful. One is just the product itself, but, uh, but the, the true issue is the adoption in terms of training and the healthcare systems at, at the ground. Give you one example with, with this product that I showed you, the VSCAN. Um, was developed a few years back, and the adoption rate in the developed markets were, were not good at all. The, the primary level, even though we, we know it was a fantastic triage, it could save a lot of, of cost at every institution if they used it in the right way, but there, there were a lot of barriers when it comes to the healthcare systems, how the incentives work, and, and so forth. But going to Sub-Sahara, we have sold about 10,000 units in Africa alone. And why? Well, they see it as a great tool of triaging and, and you know, start with a simple thing, 
uh, obstetrics and gynecology, um, obstetrics, just, just the very fact that in those areas, the maternal mortality is about 200 times all the Western world. We spent 100 years to lower that to a respectable level here. However, that didn't happen. Ultrasound can make that difference just in one shot. Three very simple investigations by, done by a non-physician. In the US, Europe, you have to be a physician to do that exam. In Africa and other places, they don't have it. They put it down to the midwives or even health community workers. Very, very simple. We connect this one over the internet and, and provide a little bit of guidance. And that's the way I think we have to think about it. Totally different paradigm of, of how we go about it. And that's the way we think about the three billion people. That was one example. It's not a disease to be pregnant. It's a condition that actually in those areas are lethal. It's a so, so difficult situation. But then you have cardiovascular disease. You have a lot of other things. You have cancer, a lot of different things we can go after specifically. I think that's the approach to go after specific things. And then, then you get a very compelling uh, a case with the MOH and, and other authorities that will tag on to it. And, um, and hopefully uh, that's going to develop these markets because they really don't exist today. So it's a market development and a market opportunity for companies. So. You go back to Philips, advise them. <laughs> 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 Question down here. We have a microphone down, down here. Thanks. Hi, my name is Julia Taylor Kennedy. I'm with an organization called the Center for Talent Innovation. So I was interested to hear subjects of talent uh, come up. And I'm actually working on a report on uh, the role of women in healthcare. Uh, and so, Building off of what you just said, I think a lot of the focus we found in our research, a lot of the focus on women has to do with that key time of life when they might be having kids or might have um, certain diseases that, that affect them more than others. But what we're interested in looking at and what I'd love to hear you comment on is how the role that women play as caregivers and that key role in wellness that they might uh, be able to bring and what companies and organizations can be doing to think more actively about how to reach out to that slice of the population who could really change behavior and uh, be part of this incentive change uh, to, um, to improve responses uh, to well care in, in addition to acute incidents. Can I I'll start with you, Sean? Sure. Women's role in yeah. wellness. Um, well, I think what you've pointed out um, in the caregiving role is probably, in my mind, speaking as somebody with a Y chromosome, um, probably the leading women's health care issue in this country. Um, right now, we have about 65 million caregivers who are providing care to either a seriously ill older relative or a child. 80% of those are women. And they spend, on average, 20 hours per week in caregiving. So that is about a half a full-time job. When we look at that population, you talked about wellness. Uh, we know that stress caregivers have a significantly increased risk of mortality, major depression, loss of work, loss of quality of life. Um, so any, I would say, innovation moving forward needs to begin to address that population. And that's going to get dramatically worse as the population both ages and, as importantly, as we develop new treatments for children who now live much longer with serious illness than they did in the past. Cystic fibrosis, for example, um, is a great example of kids now living into their mid-30s. So I actually think that this is, in some ways, the hidden healthcare crisis and the hidden caregiver issue. And thank you for bringing it up, because I do not have a solution for it. Paula, would you, would you like to? That's an interesting, it's, it's, it's a very interesting issue. And it's one that's never really quantified. There's this enormous amount of resources uh, that feeds the healthcare system in the United States and other parts of the world as well, because it typically is a woman's job. And uh, the research I've read is that in terms of the pecking order, the daughter is number one, the daughter-in-law is number two when dealing with aging parents. So it's, it, and it's, so it's very interesting in terms of, and those are social norms and gender norms in terms of society, but one country that's actually gotten ahead a little bit and has a better history on this, and this is a big public policy as well as a healthcare policy issue, is Japan, where the numbers just don't work in terms of asking the women there to do, to take care of the whole aging population there. And so there they've made a decision to have a much more 
uh, elaborate uh, uh, publicly funded uh, support for families that are, have aging parents who have health care needs and need care at home, which would typically be done by the daughter, but now they're supplementing that with public funds. That's something the United States, uh, we've been reluctant to talk about that. First of all, you'd have to quantify it, as I started out by saying, and it's an enormous amount of responsibility. And, but I think we, we and other developed countries certainly uh, have to deal with how we're, gonna deal, uh, how we're going to, at some point, quantify the need and start to think about how we're going to subsidize some of that care that is rendered so much by window, women. So much, such a majority of the uh, people doing that are women. Thank you.